thank you all for coming and thanks for the invite and the nice words. Um, it reminded me of indeed another thing I know about Kaiserslautern, except for the football team, which came through the K-Town remark. There's actually a band from Kaiserslautern, um, which probably the audience doesn't know, but it's a punk rock band, a bit old now, called the Spermbirds. And they are actually a very good example of German-American interaction because the band is all German, but the singer is American. On that note, you can Google them. Um, let's say the lyrics are perhaps a little bit on the rough side. <coughs> so what I'm going to do now is pretty much give a very broad overview tour about populism in Europe and the US trying to explain or give some of the key causes as well as the consequences. Um, but feel free to come up with any questions afterwards about anything specific. I guess there is more than enough to say these days. So if, um, I've termed it from Le Pen to Trump, but I'm talking not so much about Marine Le Pen, uh, Jean-Marie Le Pen. And that's important because at the moment, a lot of the debate about populism you know, assumes that it started a few years ago. But it has a much longer history in generally, particularly in the US, but even in Europe. Now, what I'm going to do, I'm going to tell you what I think populism is, give you a little overview of populism in Europe and the US. And we're going to assess how popular the populist wave of today is, both in Europe and the US. What are the main causes and what are the main consequences? So we start here, which is by, with the definition. Now it's important to state that obviously this is one definition and there's still, thank you. Um, there's a lot of debate about the, the term, but it's become a bit of a cliche to argue that populism is defined in so many ways that we don't really know what it is. That is true, but that's also true of democracy, for example. It's also true of the left or of the right. And so if you look at the last few years, you, what you actually see is that there is a growing consensus around what is called an ideational approach, which means that overall, Populism is seen as a set of ideas. And that set of ideas focuses on the distinction between the people and the elite. And there are very few definitions that don't have that aspect in it. Now my specific, my own definition says that it's a fin-centered ideology that considers society to be ultimately separated into two homogenous and antagonistic groups, the pure people and the corrupt elite and which argues that politics should be an expression of the volonté générale, or the general will of the people. Let me just highlight a few of the important points here. First, I argue that it's an ideology, so that it's a set of ideas that, it, that goes beyond a style or a, a rhetoric. It's not just a style to get into power. The argument is that as an ideology, it also informs what populists in power do. It informs what type of policies they introduce as well as how they justify them. It is fin-centered because the ideology as such doesn't really address a lot of the major issues. For example, on the basis of this, you don't exactly know what their socioeconomic position is. And as a consequence, very few populist actors are only populist. Many of them have other ideological features too, and I will speak about that later. Second of all, the distinction is between the people and the elite, but the core of the distinction is moralistic. It's not between the rich and the poor. It's not between the common people and the other. It's between the pure, the good, and the corrupt, the bad. So the distinction is moral. And finally, because it's also monist, it believes in homogenous groups, it believes that the people are homogenous. The people 
have one interest and all share the same attitudes. And as a consequence, there is something like a general will of the people. Populists believe that you can make policies that are good for everyone. Now, this leads to the key question because the reason why we are so obsessed with populism is because of its relationship to democracy. If you actually look at its success rate electorally, Christian democracy or liberalism is probably as strong, if not stronger, but not so sexy. Because populism is sexy because we consider it to be problematic for democracy. Now, I believe that populism is actually pro-democratic, but anti-liberal democratic. And for this, I need to make a distinction in those terms. First of all, I define democracy in a minimal sense as popular sovereignty and majority rule, which means that the people elect their own leaders by majority. That's just a minimal definition of democracy. In that sense, populism is supportive of that because they want politics to be the voice of the general will of the people. However, the system that we normally call democracy is more than that. And in academic terms, we refer to it as a liberal democracy. And liberal democracy combines popular sovereignty and majority rule with protections of the individual from the state, most notably minority rights, separation of powers, and rule of law. Populism has problems with those, given that it believes that there's only one group, the people, and that the only other group, so the only real minority, are the elite, and the elite are corrupt, they don't deserve protection. Because corrupt people are not a legitimate opponent. And so they undermine the system and therefore shouldn't be protected. Separation of power doesn't make sense because the people are homogenous, and so if the people want something, they should get it. That means that the president should not be overruled by so-called judges. Right. The same with rule of law. If the rule of law stands in the way of the voice of the people, it should step aside. Now, it's not so much that populism is a chameleon. It's more that populists come in left and right and actually center. And the reason is that most populist actors, think about parties or politicians, combine populism with a so-called host ideology, which is often actually their primary ideology. If you think about the populist radical right, parties like AFD or Front National or FPÖ, their host ideology is nativism. And nativism is a xenophobic form of nationalism. On the left, populism tends to be combined with some form of socialism. Think about Hugo Chavez in Venezuela, or think about Syriza Podemos in the south of Europe. In most cases, the host ideology is actually primary. It is more important than the populism. But the populism is important because it translates that host ideology towards the political system. So if you think about the populist radical right today, think about the Front National, Avde, whatever it is, the key issue, the key problem that they have is not so much with the elite, it's with the other, the ethnic other that comes in. However, because the ethnic other comes in, they blame the elite for letting that happen. So the first step is through nativism. If you look at socialist populists like Syriza, the first issue is austerity, is economic inequality. And the populism comes out of that because they think that the austerity and the economic inequality are a consequence of a corrupt elite that makes that possible. Now today, 
Populism is more on the left in the south and more on the right in the north. And that applies to both Europe and, let, and the Americas. So think about Trump, right-wing populism in North America, Chavez, Morales, Correa, or left-wing populist in Latin America. Similarly, um, Sweden Democrats, Party for Freedom, right-wing populism in Northern Europe, Podemos, Syriza, left-wing populism in the South. That doesn't mean that there isn't right-wing populism in the South, independent Greeks, for example, or Lega, and there is left-wing populism in the North, but overall, the strongest populist forces in the North are on the right, the strongest in general in the South are on the left. Now, populism emerged in the mid-19th century. There's some debate about it at the moment because populism is the term, which means that everyone now finds populism everywhere. But until it became a hype, we all seem to agree that it actually started in the mid-19th century. And it emerged, oddly enough, both in Russia and the US, but in very different movements and completely unconnected. After all, there was no internet yet. Right? And so it emerged in Russia through the so-called Narodniki. And the Narodniki were a small group of urban intelligentsia who went into the countryside of Tsarist Russia and tried to convince the farmers that they were the real people. And as a consequence, they should hold power. That virtue was in the peasant who grew from the land, and that the elites in Moscow, St. Petersburg, were parasiting off the peasant. Now, great story, but didn't really catch on. Because obviously, most Russian peasants were not really busy with politics. They were busy with not trying to die out of hunger. And so the Narodniki became a little bit disappointed and thought, this doesn't work. We do it another way. We kill the Tsar. And then everyone sees that we have to revolt. Unfortunately for them, they killed the Tsar, and the next Tsar killed them. <coughs> that's the top picture, and that's the end of the Narodniki. Narodniki still had some influence. Lenin wrote about them uh, several times. But in the end, the only place where this type of agrarian populism had some kind of uh, resonance was in Central and Eastern Europe in the early 20th century. Now, most of Central Eastern Europe in the early 20th century was, of course, not democratic. They were mostly authoritarian regimes controlled by, like, landlords, church, military kind of things. But in Bulgaria, the man with the Dalin moustache actually made it to prime minister in the early 20th century for two years until the army had enough and put him in prison. After that, pretty much agrarian populism was done in Europe. It only emerged as populism with a little bit of an agrarian apart in the post-war period, late 40s in Italy, late 50s with the Pujadists in France, who emerged out of nowhere in 1958 and um, got into parliament, and the next election they were gone. And the interesting thing about the Pujadists is actually how important they have been in shaping our image of populism. So the image of populism that we have had for a very long time was populism comes out of nowhere, but then can't sustain itself because it has no core. It has no organization, it's just a leader. And that was true for Pujadism, but actually even in that case, there was a legacy. First of all, Pujadism had a legacy in other political parties, but it has even an institutional legacy because someone was elected on the Pujadist list in 1958. At that point in time, the youngest parliamentarian in French, I think we're talking Fourth Republic, which was Jean-Marie Le Pen. Um, 
There is a forgotten populist legacy, which is in Greece, where a party called PASOK was in government in the late 70s, 80s. Um, for some reason, probably Greek language is very difficult and Greek is far away. Greece is far away. This also never made it into the literature. And as a consequence, we by and large see the whole post-war period as populist less until 1980. In 1980, there is the rise of the radical right, of the far right, which very quickly becomes populist. <clears throat> and the man to watch, as always, is Jean-Marie here. And this is not Marine. Aha, uh -huh. trick question. It's Marion. And Marion Marshal Le Pen, who in the election before this one, succeeded her grandfather as the youngest elected parliamentarian in French history, um, and undoubtedly is going to succeed her aunt, Marine Le Pen. So Jean-Marie Le Pen is pretty much transformative for the radical right in Europe. Nowadays, people know him as kind of a caricature of what he was. But in the 1980s, Jean-Marie Le Pen was a formidable speaker, as well as someone who really felt the mood. Front National itself was founded, as most far-right parties in the late 70s, early 80s, the co coalition of kind of old fascists and new xenophobes. And ideologically, many of the sentiments in those groups were still kind of anti-democratic elitist, the people were kind of dumb and needed good leaders. Jean-Marie Le Pen saw that that was actually not necessary anymore, that the type of sentiments that he was working on were pretty broadly shared. And so he reinvented himself as le voix de peuple, the voice of the people. And this is what his daughter, Marine, also does, au nom de peuple, in the name of the people. Right? So what they became was no longer the vanguard, the elite that knows what's good for the people. No, they became the voice of that people. And one of the best slogans that was also introduced for the Front National was, we say what you think. And we say what you think is not the classic far right. The classic far right, Hitler didn't say necessarily what the people thought, because Hitler was ahead of them. He knew better, he saw things that others didn't see. This is not what Jean-Marie Le Pen claims. Jean-Marie Le Pen claims that he is one of them. And therefore, what he says is what other people say. However, he dares to say what others don't dare to say because of political correctness, etc. Right, so the populist struggle has two elements. First, we're one of you, but second, we dare to struggle for you and take on the repression of like, political correctness, to break the political taboo. Important to remember that already in the 1990s, what I call the populist radical right gained significant support in certain countries. Front National got up to 15%, and FPE already got 26.9% in 1999. However, at that point in time, there were only a few successful populist radical right parties, and there were very few left-wing populist parties. The latter changed with the Great Recession. The Great Recession boosted, most notably, populism of the left. This is Tsipras of Syriza, Pablo Iglesias from Podemos. Those were two new left-wing populist parties that came out of nowhere, kind of, and got large support. And many people in the, on the left, and particularly many people who, like me, write for The Guardian, felt that this was the new wave that was going to come over Europe and turn it into a left-wing utopia. Uh, 
that didn't really happen. Um, we're now several years later, and left-wing populism overall hasn't really done that well. Outside of these two, many of the existing parties, like Sinn Féin or Die Linke, or the Socialist Party in the Netherlands, kind of stabilized. At the same time, radical right populist parties did take off, but not so much after the Great Recession, but more after the so-called refugee crisis. And so today, roughly, populist parties are about one and a half times as successful as before the Great Recession. Now, how successful are they? Reasonably. So I've made a, a table. Important, these are 20 countries, and we still have 28 in the EU. On the second column is the biggest populist party in that country. And the color scheme is not only to liven it, but also actually has a meaning. The red ones are populist radical right parties, combining nativism and populism. As you can see, that's the majority. The left ones are, or the red ones are left populist parties, combining socialism and populism. The blue ones are neoliberal populist parties, combining neoliberalism and populism. And the green ones are esoteric ones. Five Star Movement doesn't really have a host ideology. And the, the Finns party, until a recent split, also didn't have it. Now, what is important is this here, this column, is the score of that specific party in the last European election. And the one next to it is the score in the last national election. And what you see is that it's roughly the same. On average, 18% in the European election and 19% in the national election. But remember, this is the EU 20. There are actually 28. The ones that are not included are countries that have less successful populist party. So if you would actually calculate the average score of the biggest populist party in an EU country, it would be closer to about 15%. They rank roughly on average as the third biggest party. Important reminder because if you would follow the debate, you would think that the populist party is the biggest party because we talk about them the whole time. But on average, it's the third biggest party. We generally have a biggest party that is a liberal democratic party, a right wing or center left one, a second party, which is also a liberal democratic one, and then a third party, which is a populist one. But this score is also important. So here you see the percentage, the total score for populist parties. Many countries have more than one populist party. And so this is the total of them. And there you see it's about 25%. So one in four people vote for a populist party. But again, this is of the 20, not 28. So be generous, 17% vote for a populist party. And I just want to make that point because we can all count, but we don't often do it. That means that 83% do not vote for populists. And yet, you could easily say that 83% of all articles are about populism, and 17% are about non-populist. Right? Useful for the mindset, particularly in a country like Germany, which already for a year talks about 12.6% of the people. Finally, this is the change in the total vote for populist of comparing the last national election to the one preceding that. And the reason why I include it is to show that there isn't a big jump. 
it actually goes up reasonably general, but one of the most important things of this whole table is the diversity. Like first in colors, that means we have at least four different types of populace. Then in terms of success, as well as between elections, right? as like in the Czech Republic where you had 3.1%, whereas in Hungary you had 51%. In Belgium, the biggest populist party is the 10th biggest party. In Greece, it's the first. Most parties go up, or most populists go up, but here in Slovakia, they lost a quarter. In the United Kingdom, UKIP imploded. This is an important map, though, because while the average score is actually not as impressive as much of the literature would make you believe, there are four countries that are deeply in trouble. Hungary and Italy have almost two-thirds of the population voting for a populist party. In Hungary, we're talking about Fidesz, which is the government party, and the biggest opposition party is also populist radical right, Jobbik. In Italy, we're talking, of course, about the two coalition parties, Five Star Movement and Lega, as well as Forza Italia of Berlusconi. Greece and Poland, don't have a majority of populist vote, it's in the 40%, but they also have people voting for extremist parties who are anti-democratic. In Greece, for example, we have Golden Dawn, which is a neo-Nazi party. We also have Kakao, which is the communist party, which is by and large the Stalinist party. And so <clears throat> that together means that more than 50% vote for people who don't support liberal democracy. Right? <clears throat> so where you have certain countries where like 5.6 in total, or here 8.1 in total vote for populist parties, like fairly marginal issue, in others they are the government, and in Hungary they're the government and the main opposition. Now the US is a little bit different because in the US, populism has really been always part of US political culture. Um, and this goes back into the interpretation of the founding. And so in the US, when people talk about the founding fathers and, and the constitution, which is holier than the Bible virtually, they will talk about we the people, because that's how the constitution starts. And the interpretation is, that the founders or the framers, whatever your term of reference is, really trusted the people, which is actually wrong. If you look at the documents of that period of time, the framers really distrusted the people. That's why they made a political system that is incredibly complex, pretty much made not to function. And they made, ironically, the Electoral College. Now, the Electoral College is the step between the people and the president. It was made to prevent the people from making the wrong decision. Right? I think you can get the irony out of that. So populism emerged in the mid-19th century, also in the US, also as an agrarian populist movement. However, this time it was a grassroots movement. Not some intellectuals from the city, but actually people from the prairies, from the Midwest, also in Canada actually, um, that emerged around the same agenda to a certain extent. The peasant was the real person, the real people. Um, the speculators in the Northeast, particularly around silver and the railway industry were the corrupt elite. However, populism never got a national organization or a leader, and by the time that the Populist Party, the, which was then the People's Party, which had senators all over the place, but it didn't have a candidate for the presidential election. It actually had to go to a Democrat to be its leader. And this is what populism really always had. 
um, in the US, it had a very strong grassroots um, appeal. It had some very strong regional leaders, like Huey Long in Louisiana, but it never had a national organization or leader. Now in the 21st century, this initially didn't really change. The Great Recession gave rise to two populist movements. The Tea Party, which is now almost forgotten, but absolutely essential to understanding where we are, they combined what Americans call astroturf and grassroots. Now grassroots, we know it's spontaneous mobilization from below. Astroturf are organizations that claim to be grassroots, but actually are just big business. And so Americans for Prosperity is one of those important astroturf organizations. They're linked to the Koch brothers, which are like the evil twins, uh, brothers, the evil brothers for any lefty in the US. Um, they bankroll massive amounts of things and it's, it's actually mostly about lower taxes and less state. That is how liberals, which in the US means lefties, um, how liberals have perceived the Tea Party as a creation of evil rich funders like the Koch brothers, almost denying their grassroots. But that's a misperception. So I went to various meetings in Indiana, which is uh, pretty much heartland, and they weren't organized by the Koch brothers, they were spontaneous um, by people. And what you saw there was actually not so much the small state. You didn't see so much about deregulation. You saw the classic radical right agenda themes combined with populism. What you saw was anti-abortion, always there, anti-immigration, always there, and racism towards Barack Obama. Right, who was a Muslim Kenyan socialist. That was what the grassroots was about. And those grassroots saw the Republican Party as governed by what they call rhinos, Republicans in name only. Right? And so they were part of the corrupt elite. They were the same as the Democrats. And this sentiment was much stronger than that AstroTurf campaign. But Occupy Wall Street was also grassroots, but it was also populist. Occupy Wall Street, of course, famously introduced the distinction between the 99% and the 1%. However, what was important for Occupy Wall Street was that distinction was moral. The 1% were corrupt. The 99% were good. This weird idea that you can have a corrupt system where only 1% of the people are corrupt and everyone else is really pure. Um, the problem with Occupy Wall Street was, which is one of the key problems of the left, they don't like organization and they don't like leadership. And so they resisted that at any attempt, which meant that by the time that the state finally acted and pushed them out of their occupied spaces, they completely imploded. Today there is nothing left of Occupy Wall Street, whereas there's still many branches of the Tea Party. They both have political legacies, and to a certain extent very unlikely ones, because initially neither of them was populist. Bernie Sanders clearly became the voice of Occupy Wall Street, even though he predates it by, what, four decades? Um, however, what is important while Bernie Sanders also spoke about the 99% versus the 1%, it wasn't about morality. First of all, most of it was backed up by numbers. I mean, we have study after study that shows that more than 90% of the profit that has been generated since the Great Recession goes to the 1%. But he didn't speak about a corrupt 1%. He just said, we have 1% which are really, really wealthy, and they're working the system to stay wealthy or become wealthier. They have an interest in the system as it works now. The 99% don't, and they should therefore change the system. So it wasn't the pure people versus the corrupt elite, 
it was an elite and, and a people, a 1% and 99%, that had different interests. Much more classic capital labor type story of socialism. Now, Donald Trump had nothing to do with the Tea Party. Right? At that point in time, Donald Trump was probably still a Democrat. And Donald Trump has never put himself even in the tradition of the Tea Party. But I had a presentation of one of my students in my class, and she had this list of 30 points of one of the Tea Party groups, and I think it was the Tea Party Patriots, which was one of the most important grassroots groups. And all but three of those 30 points are key points in the campaign of Trump. And so there's a massive overlap. However, in the early, early days, Trump was not a populist. Did anyone sit through a Trump speech in the first half year? I did. It was, was rough. <laughs> <clears throat> it was, a, it was a, an endless kind of commercial for Trump, who would go off on rants about the Chinese, to then say that he really liked the Chinese and he just sold an apartment last week for three million to a Chinese person, right? That was what it was about. But he never talked about the people, right? What he sold was the Donald. And he literally said, only I can fix it, which populists don't say, because to a certain extent, populists are interchangeable. Trump is superior to the people. And that was made very clear even on his website, his campaign website, it, it by and large, like paraphrasing, had something like, if you work really hard, you can become like me. Um, but that changed when he won the nomination, which clearly no one saw coming, and probably he didn't either. And Steve Bannon, the big boss of Breitbart News, took over as campaign manager. And Steve Bannon, together with probably the most important on the radical right in the US, Stephen Miller, started to write campaign speeches. And they became very, very populist. And so Trump was now no longer selling the Donald, he was now part of a movement, he was, he was a movement. And one of the most beautiful populist speeches was his inauguration speech. In his inauguration speech, he literally said, I'm giving the White House back to the people. Like, so by having him in the White House, the people were in the White House. And so it came beautifully full circle as a populist um, <coughs> speech. However, obviously, Donald Trump is still not a populist. Right? Donald Trump still believes that he's superior to everyone. But as a political movement, it is a populist movement. And if you hear supporters of Donald Trump talk, they speak about him as the voice of the people. Right? And it's m much less about him as a successful businessman these days. It really is about him as the voice of the people. Now, why is populism successful? And more importantly, why is it successful now? What is very important as a caveat is that, as I said, populist actors, populist parties are not only populist. You cannot understand the success of Syriza or Podemos without austerity politics, socioeconomics. You can't understand AfD or Front National without the topic of immigration. But there are certain things that all populists have in common and that they play on. First of all, important issues are not adequately addressed by the elites. This is a perception but it is not without reason. When you look at issues like immigration and European integration, they were kept off the agenda in the 1980s and 1990s in most West European countries. Actually, in certain countries, they were literally like, kept off the agenda. Mainstream parties sat together to decide not to, or not to campaign on the immigration issue because they were afraid that that would create xenophobia. Um, 
On the other hand, in many cases, it's no longer true. Like the argument that immigration is no longer debated is absolutely absurd in most countries, even Germany now. But in the Netherlands, we don't do anything else than talk about immigration and Islam since 2002. The idea that you can't say anything negative about Muslims is even more absurd. Like, just look at whatever you see on social media or even in a lot of the traditional media and replace the word Muslim with Jew. Much of that you would, you would not think is okay, but the judge also wouldn't think is okay. Right? So objectively, a lot of these taboos have been broken a long time ago, but that doesn't matter. As long as people believe that that taboo is still there, they will act according to that belief. A bit similar to elites are perceived as being all the same. It doesn't matter whether you vote social democrat or Christian democrat. You always get the same thing. It's also not without any truth. First of all, quite often you get a coalition, a grand coalition. But if you don't get that, you still often get relatively similar policies for, this, for the reason that both by now have bought into roughly similar understandings. They always were pro-European integration. For a long time, they were pro-multiculturalism, whatever that meant. And of course, in the 1990s, the Social Democrats also became enthusiastic supporters of the market. <clears throat> and so the distinctions between them might be really big for policy nerds, but for an average person, they look the same. On top of that, most campaigns sound like the left saying, oh, if you vote for the right, everything goes wrong, and the right, if you vote for the left, everything goes wrong, and afterward, you get a left-right coalition. Or you get one of them, and turns out, eh, it's kind of the same. Why? Most countries are within the European Union. And within the European Union, if you're not Germany, but Greece, or some other small country, your space of making real choices is very small. And so this perception of they're all the same is objectively true if you compare it to the 70s, 80s, when the distinctions between center left and center right were much more fundamental, particularly in socioeconomic terms, um, but also simply because of the space in which parties operate at the moment. But there's also a more positive reason People have more efficacy, and efficacy is a term that, that stands for political um, kind of self-assurance. Today, people are much higher educated than they were. It's called cognitive mobilization. But it's not only that people are higher educated, they're also educated differently, much less hierarchical. And so today, a lot of people feel that they can judge politics that they can hold politicians accountable, which is exactly what democratic theory wants the people to do, but for very long was never the case. In the 50s, 60s, in the Netherlands, for example, a heavily polarized society, elections were almost always the same because Catholics voted for the Catholic party, socialists worked for the socialist party. Everyone was in their own group. And they didn't vote because they had read all the programs and thought, well, the socialists are the best one. They voted because they were socialists, they lived in a socialist structure, or because their trade unionists told them to vote socialist. The Catholics voted for the Catholic party because the priest said you should vote for the Catholic party. And if you would ask people, what do you think about politics, you would often hear, particularly of women, but also quite often of, of men and lower educated, and say, oh, I, that, I don't understand that. Now everyone understands everything. It's an awesome world. Like, we're all way cleverer than any of the politicians. And so what we're doing is we're looking around and we see something like that. We don't like that. Next one. Right? And so this is an important thing. This has created also much more volatility in general. People don't 
vote for the same party forever because they're no longer party of, part of that subculture and because they actually make choices. Now also populist actors have become more attractive. Jean-Marie Le Pen was an amazing orator. Right? In the 1980s, he actually charged equivalent of five euro for his speeches. And 2,000 people would come. Like today, political parties have to pay people five euro to come and listen. Like I saw Jean-Marie Le Pen speak in 1986 at the Assemblée Nationale, the French Parliament. He was an amazing orator. Like Geert Wilders in the Netherlands understands, understood Twitter better than any other politician. He actually knew that Twitter existed before half of other Dutch politicians had found it out. Very good with Twitter. Beppe Grillo, the brain behind the Five Star Movement, had the most popular political blog in Italy. FPE is very active on Facebook. Many more followers. And even today, even if you discount all the Russian bots, like populist parties have way more followers on social media than virtually any traditional party. And individual politicians have much more reach now, there's a reason, of course, why they are so good at social media, because they have less access to traditional media. And so they have to do that. Many politicians from the mainstream parties can work through the traditional media. And this is important because actually social media by itself doesn't do much. What social media does is it can help you break into the traditional media. If something is big on Twitter, it will hit the media because journalists live on Twitter. They honestly believe that what is big on Twitter must be big in society. And so before, when you didn't have social media, there was a very strong gatekeeper function of the traditional media. Journalists, editors decided who you had an interview with, what you could cover. Now in part because the media structure has changed and almost all media are now privately owned and funded through advertisement, if you make something big, the traditional media is going to take it because they're afraid that someone else gets the scoop. And that gives a fantastic space for outsiders, but particularly for those that sell. And what sells? Scandals. And populists are very good at scandals because everything they say is scandalous. But it is an interaction. And it's important not to think of populists as brilliant, as if they have thought everything out. Wilders came close. Trump really didn't. If you follow Trump's tweets, like, most of them are clearly spontaneous and out of the gut. It hasn't been thought about. Many didn't go anywhere. Well, he has more than a million followers, so you shouldn't say that. But they go to that one million. It's a lot of people, but you don't win elections with one million people in the US. Why he won the election was every single tweet made it to CNN, and then made it to Fox, and then made it to everyone else. I couldn't go anywhere in the US or see Donald Trump on TV every single time. And so it's that translation of social media through the traditional media that, that gives populists that advantage. Now, why should we care? Even if they, in theory, are against liberal democracy, does that actually lead to anything? There are some good things. And I think that we're, we're forgetting this. Particularly when populists are in opposition, they politicize or repoliticize certain issues. Like, remember that one of the causes was that <coughs> certain issues are not adequately addressed. European integration and immigration were addressed in the 1990s because of the radical right populists. Without them, we wouldn't have addressed them. We probably would have addressed them by now. Like, you can't keep something from the agenda forever. Like, uh, think about the refugee crisis. Right? At, at that point in time, you have to do something. <clears throat> but they brought it on. 
There are other issues that were no longer um, politicized. Austerity politics, for example, a, a certain type of socioeconomic policy. Because of Syriza, that became politicized again. They might not have been successful, but at least there was some type of debate. But another consequence of the rise of populism, both in opposition and in power, is the polarization of society. And most of the polarization starts with the populist, for the simple reason that, remember that the distinction between the people and the elite is moral. And so when your opponent is corrupt, he's an enemy. He or she doesn't deserve protection, doesn't deserve the respect that you give to a regular political opponent. It's a devious force. However, polarization rarely comes from one side. And what we see throughout the West, whatever that moniker might mean, is anti-populism. A response to populism which really is also moralistic where now the pure are the real Democrats and the corrupt are the populist. The worst statement of the 2016 US presidential campaign was Hillary Clinton's deplorables statement, where she said that Trump supporters were deplorables. That's anti-populism. That's not saying these people are misguided. No, they're immoral, deplorable, right? And when they're deplorable, you don't need to listen to them. Like they don't deserve to be part of your system. Anti-populism is very strong in Greece as well, but you see it now also the whole Brexit debate, for example. Like the way that some people in the Remain camp speak about Brexiteers is also moral. These are not worthy. And so polarization lives off each other. You also see an increase of normally the opportunistic use of plebiscitarian instruments, talking mostly about referendums. Populists love referendums in opposition, which makes sense because they see all the other parties as one. Right? And so they believe that they keep stuff that actually the people want of the agenda. Again, not always completely wrong. We had a referendum in the Netherlands in 2015, no, 2005, about the so-called European Constitution, like European Convention, which more than 80% of the parliamentarians had voted for. A majority of the people voted against. Right? So there is something there. However, when populists come into power, they often don't use referendums very long. They use them at the beginning, to break through the remaining powers of the old regime. But they often, when they lose one, they stop. And the reason is very simple. They are, after all, the voice of the people. If the voice of the people doesn't win a referendum, it becomes problematic. Now, if the voice of the people is in opposition, you can say, well, that's because of the corrupt elite. They have manipulated it. But if you're yourself in charge of it, you don't have that, right? And then you have to start to explain how the voice of the people is not really the voice of the people. And so most of the time, once a referendum is lost, that was the last one. The most problematic aspect is the weakening of non-majoritarian institutions. Those are the institutions that, that categorize the liberal democratic system. Independence of courts, independence of media, Hungary under Viktor Orban is the most problematic example. Poland under Kaczynski is the most blunt example. Right? What Kaczynski tries to do, most of it Orban already did years ago. There is virtually no independent media in Hungary. But he doesn't close them he doesn't have the state ban media because that is no longer acceptable. And again, for populists, it's important to show, to not look too weak. If you have to 
close down, repress all types of opposition, it gives the impression that you're not really the voice of the people. So there are way better ways to do that. And of course, where do we learn them? In Russia. Right? And so in Russia, also virtually no media were closed. They were bought. And they're bought in two ways. Most media are heavily dependent upon states for campaigns that finance them. And so in Hungary, if you write anything negative about the Orban regime, the state will simply no longer do its advertisements through your newspaper. So you do self-censorship. Works wonderful. If that doesn't work, as was the case in the most important opposition newspaper, Neb Shabatshak, then you just have your friend buy the newspaper. Your friend, who since you came to power, miraculously became the fifth richest person in Hungary, found a few million and bought Neb Shabatshak. That's fair, right? Capitalism, we all love that. But then friend also thinks, you know what? I don't think that there's a market for this newspaper, so I'm going to close it. No more Neb Shabatshak. Totally legal. Right? And so that's how it is done. The court see it through other ways. What it leads to is a system that is democratic in the sense that the people still elect their leaders because electoral fraud in Hungary, as far as we know, was very minuscule. But there are no checks and balances on the system anymore. On top of that, the elections are free and fair to the sense that there isn't fraud on election day. But in the months before the election, you only hear one message. And this leads to a situation where ultimately, populism can change liberal democracy into what is called an illiberal democracy. That's the system I just told you, where by and large the opposition can still freely participate, but it doesn't have the same voice because it doesn't have the media, but it's not in prison. Right? And there are courts, but they don't work exactly the same for opposition and regime. The question now is, and this is what Hungary is today, an illiberal democracy. Orban himself prefers to speak about an illiberal state. The question is, is that a sustainable model? Or is illiberal democracy by definition unstable? And does it have to go either back to a liberal democracy or will it inevitably become an authoritarian regime? And if you look at Venezuela, then that is what happened there. Venezuela was a liberal democracy, particularly by Latin American standards. Hugo Chavez took over completely democratically, changed it into an illiberal democratic system where the opposition could still win. And then particularly under Maduro, it has become an autocratic system where the opposition cannot win elections. Turkey might be one election away from that same moment. Right? And so the question is, will populism in power still hold a democratic facade where at least in theory opposition can win, albeit with much more effort than the government parties, or will it inevitably just become an authoritarian system which still holds elections but manipulates them in such a way that opposition can never win? Again, think about Russia. Anyone who ever emerges as a potential uh, threat, electoral threat to Putin, gets the IRS, like the tax services, at their door, and if that doesn't work, we'll go to jail. So in conclusion, <coughs> populism has a long history in Europe and the US, but was largely marginal before the 21st century. It is speaking in the early 21st century, but its popularity is overstated. Again, on average, we're talking about 
to remind you of the German situation, even if you include Die Linke, where the populism is lower, although they're going up again, like we're still talking about a minority of the population voting for populists. Its relationship to democracy is complex. Populism can both be a corrective and a threat for liberal democracy. The corrective part is almost exclusively in opposition by pointing out like undemocratic aspects, illiberal um, and issues that are not being debated, giving voice to people that have been kept out of the debate. Mostly as soon as they come in power, particularly by themselves, and that's important because so far most populists were always in coalition with a non-populist. And the non-populists tended to be the stronger part. Think about the first Schussel governments in Austria, right, where OVP, FPO were in government, but OVP was the much was the senior partner, and they kept FPO in check. In Italy, you have two populist parties; they have to keep each other in check. And in Hungary, there's just one; no one keeps him in check. And finally, populism is an illiberal democratic response to undemocratic liberalism. Now these are the kind of alliterations that I live off, they're highly quotable, but they actually also have a meaning. I think it's clear why populism is illiberal democratic. But what I mean with undemocratic liberalism is that over the last decades, particularly since the 90s, we have seen a strong advance of liberal policies, both economic and cultural, that have been pushed through, think about um, legalization of gay marriage, think about um, putting things into central banks that are independent, privatization of all kinds of sectors. Many of these things have been done democratically in formal terms, in the sense that these were democratically elected politicians that decided on them. But many of these decisions were made without any fundamental debate. They were not following an open debate about whether we should do these things, and then we voted on them. They were done outside of that scope, outside of the electoral scope, and they're to today defended outside of that. Because today, what populists really attack is what is called Tina politics. There is no alternative. And this is what a lot of politics has become today. When you talk about neoliberalism, when you talk about multiculturalism, very broadly defined, when you talk about European integration, there's almost not a party left that actually truly supports them ideologically and says, these work for these and these reasons. Most of the debates are, there is no alternative. We cannot do anything else because the alternative is worse. And populists say, no, it isn't, and we'll show you. Thank you.